What's up, guys? <clears throat> Let's have a quick lecture on joints and articulations. Now, this stuff's pretty darn straightforward. There's not a lot of complication. You just got to throw some terms at it. Let's try to enjoy ourselves. Okay, generally speaking, what we're dealing with here are areas where two or more bones come together and join with one another. That could be a solid junction. That could be a mobile junction. It could be all kinds of different things. So we need ways to describe these. And the way that we do it is all uh, what's referred to as structural classifications first, and then we further base those structural classifications into functional classifications. And when I get into it, this is going to make perfect sense, but for time being, there are fibrous joints, joints with fibers. There are cartilaginous joints, <clears throat> joints with cartilage. And then there are synovial joints, which are very complex. Okay, the, the fancy joints, the ones like this, those are synovial joints. They are way more complex than the others. Uh, then we further define those by their functional classes. That could be synarthrotic, okay, synarthroses. Syn means together or fixed. Arthrotic means junction or uh, articulation. So synarthrotic means non-moving. They are fixed to one another, immovable joints. Antiarthrotic means eh, kind of moving, okay? They kind of have some give to them. They bend, okay? Uh, and then there are diarthrotic joints, and diarthrotic joints are freely moving, okay? They are freely moving joints, uh, diarthroses, freely moving. Now, here is an infant skull. On that infant skull, you can see all the excess fiber here. You can see the fontanelles. You may have heard of a soft spot. I mean, I... <laughs> I remember looking at my kids and you could see when they have no hair basically, you could see like their heart beating pretty much in the fontanelle. You could see it moving with their heartbeat. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen. The skull is quite fibrous to make it to where it can compress and move a little bit as the kid's being born. It's part of the process, okay? Now, as the kid develops, uh, the brain has to have a lot of room very early. The brain has to reach its full adult size by the time you're about, you know, six years old or so. Okay. I'm sorry, that's incorrect. Uh, eight or nine years old or so. In other words, the skull reaches its adult size by the time you're 10 years old. That's why little kids like my beautiful girl here appear to have a head that's as big as her whole body when they're very young because the head gains size very quickly. What will happen is as the head is attaining size, these skull bones will slowly grow together in the areas where this excess fiber is and form fibrous joints, okay? Now, there are three types of fibrous joints. There are sutures, syndesmoses, and gomphoses. This is a suture. Sutures are the connection points in the skull, where the skull bones grow together and they attach to one another using incredibly short fibers. This would result in a joint, which is still fibrous, but it is synarthrotic. It is non-moving. It does not move at all. It is synarthrotic. Uh, so sutures are where you have very short fibers connecting bones together, and those uh, joints are non-moving. They are synarthrotic. Yeah. Next are syndesmoses. Syndesmoses are the, uh, for instance, the interosseous membranes between the radius and the ulna, or the um, interosseous membranes between the tibia and the fibula. And these are somewhat variable. They're still fibrous joints, but because the fiber length can be a little longer, they can be a little amphiarthrotic. Like in the tibia and fibula, it's more on the synarthrotic side. These don't really move. But between the radius and the ulna, there's a little movement allowed in there. I mean, it's not full-on articulation, but it can stretch a little. Okay, so that would be amphiarthrotic. All right, if that makes any sense at all. So it is a syndesmosis. Uh, the, these longer ligaments between bones allowing for some degree of movement by comparison to tiny little ligaments allowing for no movement at all. And then last but not least of the fibrous joints are the gomphoses. Now a gomphosis is uh, the type of joint where, well, okay, gomphosis means uh, in essence like a nail in a hole. It's fancy, but anyway, the idea is this is where the teeth connect to the jaw. We have these deep concavities. Uh, yeah, gomphos means to nail. Uh, so you have this deep concavity with these tiny little ligaments that hold the teeth in place. For those of you that have uh, ever, if you can remember pulling a tooth or having a tooth removed, 
Uh, the sensation is that of cracking or almost like an unzipping sensation. What's happening there is there are ligaments that hold these teeth in place and those ligaments are what have to be torn for the tooth to come out, all right? Um, yeah, so these, these teeth here in the, in the uh, jaw, these are gonna be completely synarthrotic. They are non-moving, or at least they're not supposed to move. Uh, but because of the nature of these, this is why we can put braces on the teeth and twist them and turn them and then hold them in place for a long period of time. And then when the braces come off, the teeth stay in place. It's because of these ligaments. It's not unlike the way that we treat uh, scoliosis. Here we go. Yeah, all right, so this is a gumphosis. This is dealing with the teeth, and it is synarthrotic. <clears throat> Cartilage and joints. Moving on. Now, there are two types of cartilaginous joints. These are the synchondroses and the symphyses. A syn Let me make sure that's not on full. Yeah, okay. Uh, the synchondroses are going to be using entirely hyaline, uh, hyaline cartilage. So the classic synchondrosis is like here in the ribs, uh, this top rib. You have bone to cartilage to rib, or I'm sorry, bone to cartilage to the manubrium of the sternum. That is a synchondrosis, an area where hyaline cartilage connects two bones together in a synarthrotic fashion. So you've got non-moving bones here that is synarthrotic, that is a cartilaginous joint. Or I'm sorry, I should say a synchondrosis, which is in essence cartilaginous. Let me try that one more time so that we're clear. These are cartilaginous joints, and one of them is called a synchondrosis, like here in the rib, and it would be non-moving, it is synarthrotic. Boy, that's a lot in one mouthful. All right, moving on. Then there are syntheses. Now, a synthesis is a type of cartilaginous joint. A synthesis is a cartilaginous joint that includes fibrocartilage, okay? So these are very rare, uh, but generally speaking, we think about... the intervertebral discs, okay? Your intervertebral discs are classic syntheses, and uh, as such, they allow a little bit of movement. They are amphiarthrotic, okay? They allow a little bit of give, they're amphiarthrotic. Uh, your pubic synthesis in the front of the pelvis, that would be, let me see if I can not have this fall apart when I pick it up. <laughs> Too bad. All right, the pubic synthesis, which is here, all right, that is also going to be a fibrous, no, 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 wrong, wrong, wrong. Let me get this back together. That is also going to be a synthesis because it also includes some degree of fiber cartilage. And in essence, every time you take a step, all right, oh, well, here we go. Every time you take a step, these uh, pubic bones shimmy just a little bit. Not quite as much as I'm showing, but for my purposes, they shimmy because this joint is amphiarthrotic. It's got a little bit of give to it. And uh, when one is pregnant, uh, the pubic synthesis really loosens up a great deal. So you can really feel the pelvis moving a lot. It's a wild thing, man. Um, okay, so synchondrosis using hyaline cartilage. This is like in the ribs. Or alternatively, your, um, your growth plates, your epiphyseal plates would be considered synchondroses. By comparison, yeah, here they are. By comparison, a synthesis is gonna be using some fiber cartilage. That's like your intervertebral discs and your pubic synthesis, but here you might say, but Mr. Hopper, don't your knees contain fiber cartilage? And to that I would say, yes, they do. Your knees have meniscus, which is fiber cartilage, but your knees are not cartilaginous joints. Your knees are way more complicated. Your knees are synovial joints, all right? They are synovial joints. <clears throat> all synovial joints, they are, they are vastly more complicated than the other joint types. And they will all have the following characteristics. They will have an articular cart, uh, <clears throat> let me try again. They will have articular cartilage, as you can see here. This is leftovers from your fetal skeleton. <coughs> this is gonna be fiber cartilage. It's gonna allow those bones to move past one another. Think about the articular cartilage as forming a super smooth base so that the bones can move past one another while generating as little friction as possible. Next, they'll have a synovial cavity. That will be this opening seen here. And uh, this will have a capsule around it, the synovial or articulating capsule. Now, it's kind of hard to determine where to start here and where to end, but the essence of it is this. The synovial cavity 
No, no, no. Let me try again. The articular capsule surrounds the entire joint. And we call the opening inside of there a synovial cavity because uh, this, there's what's referred to as a synovial membrane that produces synovial fluid that fills that cavity. Now let me try that one more time. This cavity is called the synovial cavity and it's full of a fluid called synovial fluid. And that synovial fluid is basically a lubricant. So we've got our articulating cartilage that's ultra smooth so that the bones can glide past one another without damage. We've got our synovial fluid that is a lubricant that really lets those things slide past one another. We've got the capsule itself that strengthens the whole thing and makes it uh, where it's le less likely to dislocate. And we have ligaments that anchor the bones to the bones and keep that joint from breaking loose. This is a synovial joint. And the nature of synovial joints, like those in my hand here, is that they are diarthrotic. They are freely moving. Okay, they are freely moving. Now, you also find some other things in here. Sometimes there can be fatty pads that help it to be like a cushioning mechanism. There can be articular discs, uh, meniscus, like in your knees, that are made out of fiber cartilage that kind of help to surround and keep things together. But at the end of the day, if it's got these characteristics, synovial fluid being key amongst these, it is a synovial Joint. Now, um, the way this actually works is kind of cool. The, the joint itself is full of synovial fluid, and the idea is that when you take a step, like my knee, and I put pressure against my knee, it's going to compress the synovial fluid and push the synovial fluid out of the joint cavity and into the surrounding membrane. So it pushes it out. So in other words, when I take a step, my knee goes like this, like a shock absorber. Then I take the weight off of it, and it re-expands with fluid. And I put weight back on it, slowly compresses again. Uh, the idea is that these synovial joints, synovial membranes, the way that they're set up is uh, they, they work like a shock absorber. They, they will keep you from uh, damaging the bony structures in your joints by absorbing the shock from movement in the fluid. Yeah, I guess that'll do. Uh, what else do I want to say here? I guess we can mention this. So here is a contortionist. A person who might say they are double jointed, like you've seen people kind of pull their thumb down and touch their arm or take this finger and pull it back and touch their arm. Uh, what this is is quite simple. Uh, these are people who have very loose ligaments. The looser your ligaments, the more flexible you are. The tighter your ligaments, the less flexible you are. And that's neither good nor bad. It's just random genetic variation. Sometimes if your ligaments are very loose indeed, it can contribute to dislocating your joints, which is bad. Uh, but, you know, neither here nor there. All right. Uh, you may also have what are called bursae or tendon sheaths. Now, a bursa is a tendon sheath, and a tendon sheath is a bursa in essence. Uh, so a bursa is like a sack of synovial fluid that as you sort of move your joints around, they leak out a little bit of synovial fluid and lubricate the area around them. And then sometimes bursae will wrap themselves around tendons so that when the tendons are moving past one another, they leak lubrication to keep those tendons from building friction. So basically, these are both little sacs of synovial fluid that weep out lubrication whenever the area is being used. Uh, so they're almost like oilers on an old piece of machinery. Like when the machinery is being used, it oils it by itself on its own automatically. And when the machine is not being used, like your shoulder here, uh, they store up fluid and uh, don't weep out lubrication. So yeah, yeah, that's how this works. So these are good for dividing things up and keeping uh, friction from developing. Uh, synovial joint stability. So joint stability and range of motion go hand in hand. Let me say it again. Joint stability and range of motion go hand in hand. The more stable a joint is, the less range of motion you have. The more range of motion you have, the less stable a joint is. Uh, and three things sort of determine this. These are the shape of the articulating surface, the number and strength of the ligaments involved, and of course we have muscle tone. So the shape of the articulating surface. Look at this, folks. Here I've got a humerus, and here I have an ulna. And the way that these articulate, man, let me tell you, that is a deep, deep concavity that that fits into. So this, this joint's just really stable. How many times have you ever heard of somebody dislocating their elbow? Okay, it doesn't happen very often. 
because this joint is so freaking stable. You'd have to break the end of the ulna off to really dislocate this thing. So the, the shape of the articulating surface, the deeper the concavity, the stronger the joint is, uh, the more stable it is, the less range of motion. So look at this. Like here's my elbow at its extent, and here it is flexed as much as I can flex it. So what is that? Like a like 160 degrees of motion? It's very little in essence. Very, very little. By comparison, here is a scapula, and here is our humerus. The scapula has this tiny little glenoid cavity, and it fits like this. It's pretty much a flat edge resting against a round edge. That shape of, of the articulating surface, that shape of the concavity, results in a very, very uh, high range of motion for a shoulder joint. I mean, my shoulder can do all kinds of things. I mean, I can just do so much with it. Like, I can go all over the place. But the side effect is it's not very stable. How many times have you ever, have you ever heard of someone dislocating their shoulder? That happens often. Okay, that's a red, it happens readily, I should say. Uh, all right, ligamentation. So the tighter the ligaments, the uh, more stable the joint is, but the less range of motion you experience. And by comparison, if your ligaments are quite loose, that means you have more range of motion, but your joints are not very stable. That's like our contortionist friend here. And then last but not least is muscle tone. So the more muscle tone you have, the more stable your joints are, uh, the less range of motion. By comparison, if um, your muscles are not toned at all, your range of motion tends to be extraordinarily high and your joints are very unstable and more prone to dislocations. Uh, for a long time, my wife struggled with dislocating her shoulder and I finally talked her into going to see a doctor about it and they're like, yeah, well, what you need to do is go to physical therapy and build up the muscles in your shoulder and then you won't dislocate it anymore. So she said, no, I'm not doing that. I'd rather dislocate my shoulder. Uh, <laughs> So the idea is if you, if you exercise a lot, you build a lot of muscle tone, that will make your joints more stable. You probably realize this. I invite you to pause this video and go look up like a hardcore bodybuilder and watch how they move. They kind of shimmy around because they're all tight because they've got so much muscle tone. Uh, bodybuilders have so much muscle tone that the joints are super stable at the expense of having very little range of motion. You don't see a lot of hardcore bodybuilders that can bend over and touch their toes, okay? Very limited, I would say. Uh, so joint stability and range of motion are very fascinating. Here's that glenoid cavity with the humerus, flat concavity resulting in dislocations. Scary stuff, man. Um, okay, so I'm gonna run through these with you, but I'm gonna do it pretty quick. This is interesting. I might throw a question or two on your test, but. No, not more than that. Uh, there are plane joints, hinge joints, pivot joints, condyloid joints, saddle joints, and ball and socket joints for our purposes. And we can further classify these as being non-axial, uniaxial, biaxial, or multi-axial. Uh, let me give you examples of these. Well, I guess I'll just do it as I go. Plane joints. Plane joints are like those that are seen in the wrist and the carpals. Uh, these bones are quite square, and they don't really rotate around each other. What they do is it's kind of kind of shimmy, okay? They kind of shimmy, they glide past one another. They don't rotate, so it's considered non-axial. These are slipping movements. They, they just kind of move past one another like this. They don't rotate, okay? So it's not on an axis. This is a plane joint. A hinge joint is like that seen in a door. Like my elbow, that is a hinge, okay? My finger here, that is a hinge. Uh, it is typically uniaxial. If I put a pin through my elbow, it would rotate on that axis, okay? It is a uniaxial joint, a hinge joint. A pivot joint is also uniaxial. Uh, we talked about the pivot joint in between your um, atlas and your axis and your neck. It allows you to turn your head like so. And there's a pivot joint in your uh, radius and ulna here that allows for the twisting of my arm. It rotates on a single axis, pivot joint. Condyloid joints are where you have a rounded end fitting into a uh, articulation, like here, not here, but here, okay? This would be like a, a um, hinge joint. This is a condyloid joint. And the nature of a condyloid joint is that they are biaxial, okay? Watch what I can do. I can ask you to come this way, 
All right, there's one axis of movement, but alternatively, I can tell you no, that's not nice, and that is a separate axis of motion. It's two axes. So that would be a biaxial joint like a condyle, a condyloid joint. And saddle joints uh, are basically a modification of a condyloid joint. Uh, this is pretty much where your thumb is located. That's a saddle joint. It can do the same thing. It can go two different ways. So it's biaxial, and it is a saddle joint, a modification of a condyloid joint. And then last but not least, ball and socket. Uh, ball and socket joints display all the range of motion, man. Okay, you can rotate them this way, you can come this way, I can come up and down on it. It's multi-axial. Ball and socket joints where you have a sphere on the head of a bone and it fits into the socket of another bone, moving in all planes. That is a ball and socket joint displaying the widest range of motion, but it's multi-axial. All right, uh, let's break these down a little bit further and talk about some neat modifications. So in terms of movement, there are gliding motions like that seen in the wrist where the bones just kind of vibrate past one another. There are angular motions like flexion, extension, and hyperextension. Flexion would be this motion. Extension would be this motion. And then if I want to, I can really extend my arm or my neck. You know, I can flex my neck, I can extend my neck. I can really hyperextend it. Uh, so these are ways in which we are capable of moving. Flexion being decreasing in angle, extension being increasing in angle. Uh, let's see, rotation is pretty obvious, but abduction and adduction probably not so much. Uh, abduction, all right, the way that my old hardcore anatomy professor would say this is that if uh, you know the light hits you at night and you're being abducted by aliens, you kind of float up in the air like this. So abduction is like to raise your arms. Uh, so abduction, abduction, to raise your arms. As opposed to adduction, if I take my arms and I add them to my body, I am adducting, adducting. So abduction versus adduction. And then of course there's pronation and supination. Uh, to pronate, your arms are like this. To pronate is to rotate the thumbs down. To supinate is to rotate the thumbs up. Uh, the way my old athletic training folks at UA would say this is that if you walk up to someone and you ask them for soup, like, may I have some soup? That is supination, and the alternate of that would be pronation, like so. Now, why am I asking you to learn these terms? Because this is how we grade people's joint health as we age. Imagine someone with rheumatoid arthritis. They've got rheumatoid arthritis in their elbow, in their arm, and their wrist. So what we have them do is we have them uh, pronate as far as they can pronate. We measure the angle generated. And then we have them supinate as far as they can supinate, and we measure the angle generated. We can monitor on a weekly basis, monthly basis, their joint health to see if medications are working or not. These terms are very important. How much can you abduct? How much can you adduct? This is how we can measure joint health to make sure that things are working the way they're supposed to work. It's a good idea. Um, yeah, we sort of already played the knee game a little bit. I'm not that concerned. Like you know about your, your knee joint at this stage. Uh, you can tell me about the, um, oh man, I'm gonna just guess that some of you haven't watched the lab video yet. So let's talk about it. <clears throat> We're looking at the front of the knee here. I want you to know the names of the ligaments. This is a right knee. So if that's a right knee, then this would be the um, lateral collateral ligament. This would be the medial collateral ligament. This would be the patellar ligament. And these are called the patellar retinaculum, which you don't have to know, but that's what they are. And then if you pull the patella down and you lift this thing up, there's a posterior cruciate ligament in the back and an anterior cruciate ligament in the front that connects in the middle of the knee at a structure called your intercondylar eminence on the tibia as seen here. So yeah, four ligaments that I'm really concerned with you knowing. Anterior cruciate, posterior cruciate, uh, lateral collateral, medial collateral. And then for fun, let's throw the meniscus in there too. You can see the two cup-like menisci uh, that will help support the knee. You don't have to have these. But what the meniscus do is they form these little cups like this that help to hold the knee together when you're doing the things you do um, because the knee takes so much weight it needs a little extra support.
because we don't want to blow out ligaments. <laughs> um, what do I want to say here? So sprains and cartilage damage and dislocations. Um, you can stretch your ligaments. You can damage your cartilage. One of the problems with this is that cartilage and ligaments to a lesser degree are um, avascular. And because they're avascular, they don't heal or they don't heal fast. So if you damage cartilage, it takes a long time to get back to normal. Um, and in some cases, it never gets back to normal because you can end up with what we call loose bodies. When you damage cartilage in the knee, and I think I got a picture, yeah, like this here, you can tear up pieces of that cartilage, and that forms what we call loose bodies. And it's like having a piece of cartilage floating around in the joint cavity. So every time you put pressure on that joint cavity, it's being squished inside of there. And what you don't know about this is that causes the release of a lot of inflammatory chemicals that cause the cartilage in the area to be completely destroyed by the body. Uh, the body just uh, tears it to shreds using macrophages anytime it's squeezed in that fashion. And uh, that eventually will result in osteoarthritis setting in at a very young age if you do this early on. Um, so that's very bad. What we tend to do when we do arthroscopic surgery, which is what we're showing here, is we will go in and if we can kind of sew things back together we will but if we can't we tend to just scoop out the area of damage and sand it down flat so that it becomes smooth and you don't release those inflammatory chemicals and then over time it can heal um, so yeah yeah that's cartilage and uh let's see last but not least i think yes last but not least let's talk about arthritis and then we'll call it a day uh, arthritis, there are a variety of forms of this. We will talk about three, and these are umbrella terms, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gout, or gouty arthritis. Uh, osteoarthritis is a fact of life. You will all have osteoarthritis to some degree at some stage in your life if you live long enough. And this is basically where uh, you used your joints so much that over time the cartilage will wear out. It's just life, no matter how good you are to it. And when it wears out, you get bone-to-bone -bone contact, and it's like rock grinding against rock. You hear grandma's knees, and they're like, <laughs> or alternatively, perhaps your knees. Um, you, you can hear that grinding sound. That's classic osteoarthritis. It hurts. The tissue lays down excess bone, so there's a lot of bone deposition. So you get these swollen up joints, like, like the joints here on the, the hands of this person. Classic osteoarthritis, man. Uh, a result of cartilage breaking down, bone-to-bone -bone contact, and damage therein. Yeah, that'll work. And then there's rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease where uh, white blood cells come in and attack the synovial membrane and destroy it. And what's left behind is this really rough textured tissue so that every time you move your joints, this rough tissue grinds against the cartilage in the area. Like every time you move the joint, this grinds this rough tissue into the cartilage and it wears the cartilage out very quickly indeed. Uh, and the joints start to dislocate. And then when they dislocate, it hurts, you don't move them. And then when you're not moving them, they kind of uh, calcify into the location they're in. So you end up with these dislocated fingers and things, dislocated bones, and uh, it's a very painful and awful situation. And it's classic rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune disease. And then, of course, there's gout. So gout is a um, situation where I think it's purine nucleic acids. I don't have it on here. I think uh, when you're eating really rich foods, like foods rich with a lot of purines, uh, this will result in like really high quantities of uric acid being in the bloodstream as a result of their breakdown. And when uric acid content is very high in the bloodstream, the kidneys can't keep up with getting rid of it. So you end up with uric acid depositing itself in your joint cavities and forming uric acid crystals. Now, when we, uh, we tend to notice this first in the big toes. It's called a uh, hallux gout, toe gout. Uh, so you end up with these little bitty uh, uric acid crystals forming in the joint cavity. And it's like having a rock in your shoe every time you move that uric acid crystal grinds into this pristine, beautiful cartilage. Again, this is completely white because it has no blood flow to it. It's avascular. So what you see here is basically just a bunch of collagen fiber. Imagine having a little rock in there. So every time you take a step, it grinds into that rock. It hurts. It's very painful. It's not a fun experience. And in extreme situations, you can have these huge buildup, 
huge buildups of crystals that really deform the joints themselves. Uh, this would be a really a sign of a kidney issue where the kidneys aren't getting rid of uric acid. But all the same, this is gout. Uh, and most often this is seen as in males. You don't really see a lot of, of ladies getting gout. Uh, just a side effect of the hormones that we, we produce, uh, gout is far more likely in males than females. And I think that's it. Normally you can just modify your diet and gout's not a, a problem at all. Like if you're eating a bunch of deli sandwiches all the time, you're gonna, <laughs> well, you may get gout. Uh, so you can cut out that and start eating other foods and decrease your likelihood of having gout. And that's it. That's all I want to say. So uh, let's stop there. I think that's really good enough for us. And I will be uploading your next lecture pretty soon. All right. Thanks, guys.